Welcome everyone. We are so excited to have you here today for our webinar on what is PEP hospice. My name is Lisa Longhofer. I'm the executive director of the Gray Muzzle Organization. And I'm joined by my colleagues, Amanda Grant. Give a wave there, Amanda and Laura Merrick. We'll be helping to um, facilitate questions. So before I introduce Dr. Mary Gardner, our um, presenter today, please feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A box if you're joining us on um, Zoom or um, in the comments if you're joining us on Facebook Live and we will try to get to as many of those questions as we can. If there are questions outstanding um, when we end, we'll, we'll try to get answers for you to those as well. All right, so without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Mary Gardner, who has presented for us before. She is just one of our favorite people here at Gray Muzzle. She's on our um, advisory board, and she has a special place in her heart for the skinny, wobbly, gray muzzled pets. She's passionate about geriatric care, and she's a veterinarian who co-founded Lap of Love Veterinary Hospice a nationwide practice whose 200 veterinarians provide in-home hospice, euthanasia, and end-of-life care. She is a published um, author and co-editor of the textbook Treatment and Care for the Geriatric Veterinary Patient, and she just published um, a month or two ago um, her book for dog owners, It's Never Long Enough, a practical guide for caring for your senior dog, which I thank you, Dr. Mary, for sending me a copy. Um, it's, a, it's a great book, so let me put in um, just a vote of confidence for that. We're so glad that you that you wrote that and shared your knowledge um, with the world. Um, Dr. Mary Gardner travels the world speaking about geriatric medicine, assessing quality of life, veterinary hospice, euthanasia, and caregiver burden. A 2008 University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine graduate, she was awarded the Angel Award for the recognition of the human-animal bond. She's also received the Alumni Achievement Award from the University of Florida in 2016, and in 2020, won BM Speaker of the Year, a very high achievement in the veterinary space. So we could not be happier to have you here with us today, Dr. Mary, and I'm going to turn the floor over to you and, and thank you again for being here. No worries. Thanks for having me again. I love speaking with um, all of your members and, and, uh, and the other fellow lovers of the geriatric and senior week and wobblies that are out there. And what you guys do at uh, the Gray Muzzle Organization is wonderful. So I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. And my presentation today is gonna to be about pet hospice and, and what is that? Because there's a lot of miscommunication or misinformation out there of what, of what really that is. And I wanted to take this opportunity to, to shed some light on, on, on what you can do for your pet when they are nearing their end of their life. And we've been doing hospice in the veterinary space for my, myself and the Lapala veterinarians for, uh, for over 12 years. But I have to say there are some people that think hospice for pets isn't that prolonging suffering and I hope that by the end of this presentation you will see that it is actually quite the opposite and that we are making sure that the pets have a good quality of life for the few weeks to months that they have left and sometimes we do see pets at the very near end of their life and it can be a little bit sad for us but we can also provide a lot of uh, palliative care so making sure that they're not painful that they're not nauseous that they don't have anxiety uh, and things like that, and prep the family for saying goodbye when the time does come. So uh, I, I kind of think this is sometimes a chance for us to just smell the roses and see the ocean with our with our with our furry loved ones. So I want to start this out with a case study. Bogey, one of my favorite hospice patients in Southern California. So Bogey is a when I saw him for hospice, a 13 year old um, male golden retriever. And he was diagnosed with lymphoma about a month before I saw him. And lymphoma is a, a very common disease in golden retrievers and some other breeds as well. And so when I'm doing a hospice evaluation, I'm going to look at a number of things. And I'm going to talk about the five ingredients of, of my hospice protocol. 
But for Bogey, we first assessed what medications he was currently on. So he was on some tramadol for pain, gabapentin for pain as well, prednisone, which is a steroid for his um, lymphoma, and famotidine for his belly because he was having um, that high amount of steroids can give a little belly upset. So the parents' concerns, wonderful family, was that they were worried that he was in pain or was he suffering? Now, Bogey's a big boy, but he was starting to have a decrease of appetite. And also his bowel movements were getting a little bit soft and, and having accidents around the house. And they really wanted to know when is time. And uh, one of the important things to note was that this was beginning of December and they wanted to know, will he make it to the holidays? And I often get asked that, do you think he's got two more weeks or four more weeks or six months? And, um, you know, there's no magic ball with, with life and death, but we can definitely plan for the good goodbye when it does come. And so the family also always had Bogey on their Christmas cards. And so they wanted to know, should we put Bogey on our Christmas card this year? Because what if he doesn't make it? And I thought, absolutely, he should definitely grace the Christmas card, maybe even for years to come, and he'll still be a Christmas angel. But we wanted to make sure until that time, if he makes it to that time, that he's comfortable and feeling good. And so when I did go visit him on December 10th, he was the typical golden, just happy. You know, they have the love gene, the tail was wagging, the booty was, was shaking side to side. Now he had what we call a body condition score of seven out of nine. This means how, how chubby is Bogey. And a five is good. So he had a little extra weight on him. He had some mobility issues, which is very normal in this age and this breed, especially with a little bit of extra weight on him. So we had to make sure that we were managing his pain. Parents were saying that he had trouble sleeping at night now, was waking up you know, a couple of times in the night, but he loved his couch. He loved to go sit on his couch and, and, uh, and hang out there. So there's a part of hospice that definitely includes a medical, a medical point or, or a medical part of it. And I wanted to make sure that they continued some of those pain meds. So we continued the gabapentin and I said, you know what, it kind of takes a few weeks to get that kicked in. So if any of you have pets that are on gabapentin, a lot of times we start at a lower dose because we don't want them too sleepy or wobbly. And it does take about three weeks to start kicking in. And we wanted to continue his steroids, which would help him for his, um, for his cancer to at least slow it down a little bit. But tramadol is actually not really very good for long-term chronic pain in dogs. It's okay in cats. So we added actually some Tylenol with some coating to it. So make sure he can sleep at night. And then a little flagell and pumpkin for his mushy, mush, mushy poop that was happening. So that's a lot of technical stuff, which is not something I want to concentrate on. I want to talk about all the other things that we can do. First off, I wanted to make sure he was getting brushed daily because, you know, Golden's got that beautiful fur. We want to make sure he keeps being clean, especially if he's having accidents. We want to make sure that we, um, uh, you know, keep his little booty clean, giving him massages, which, was, which is so helpful for, for pain or arthritis, monitor his ability to get on the couch. And if we needed to uh, set him up with a harness or a ramp or something like that, and then start quality of life, scale, and diary. And so we created, uh, we had big posty notes that, that we put on the wall and everybody in the family would write notes to say, how long did Bogey sleep through the night? Did he, um, did he eat all his meal? How much medication did they need to give to make sure he was comfortable? And then I said, take lots of pictures and videos of Mr. Bogey. So here he is in Southern California, Christmas time. So those of you who are in the North, don't get jealous. And here he is at the beach, just enjoying every single day as much as he possibly can. So I want you to check him out as he, uh, as he comes towards the family. Oops. I was reading a comment. For the person who wrote the comment, yes, I said tramadol. So there's Mr. Bogey. And you can see he's doing this little, uh, called a hitch in the giddy up. And uh, so, that, so I could see that he's got some arthritis in his, in his front, uh, front legs, probably along with his back legs because he does his little head bop. So what is hospice? Well, at Lap of Love, we define it as a family-centered, medically supervised, and team-oriented service dedicated to preserving the animal-human uh, bond by maintaining comfort and quality of life for the terminally ill or chronically or uh, chronically ill patient until natural death or euthanasia happens. It's very important that it is medically supervised. There are some people who 
go and adopt very old pets, which I love them because that's what I would do. And the gray muzzle organization is a great proponent of that. Um, and then they call that hospice. That's not hospice. You're just like me and a sucker for an old animal. So <laughs> this is when the pet is very nearing the end. We're making life decisions. We're making sure that they're comfortable. So it needs to be medically supervised to make sure that we are monitoring their quality of life. But this is a team. So it's the whole family involved. It might be technicians. It might be babysitters or pet sitters rather. And, uh, and so it's definitely needs to, to sometimes be more than one person. But sometimes that's all we have is one person. So veterinary hospice or pet hospice is not about living longer, but it is about living better during the end. However, in human hospice, they have found that the sooner the person enters hospice care, they actually will live longer and better. So please know that we're not just extending bad life. We're actually making the life that we have good. And sometimes we actually do get to have more time because when you're fighting away pain and you're fighting away nausea and you're, and you're keeping them comfortable, actually good things happen. So, um, and it also provides time for the family to, to prepare for saying goodbye to their pet. So with hospice care, when does this happen? Um, there are going to be diseases that affect our pets at any life stage. So hospice could happen to a puppy or kitten. So we may have a puppy that's got distemper and we have to say goodbye to them, but we want as a family to just have a, the weekend. Uh, and so it might just be a few days that we make sure that they're comfortable and prepare for, for saying goodbye to, to the one that we didn't get to have a, a full life with. It may happen to an adult dog. So maybe um, a, a, a five-year-old Rottweiler has osteosarcoma, which is a bone cancer, and we have to say goodbye. Oftentimes it's, it's when we're advanced age. So senior, seven to eight-year-old for, uh, for most dogs. And then the geriatric phase is when we've got, um, you know, they're very fragile and they're double digits of age and, and slow and we have to be careful with them. So at any time during a dog's life phase, whether it's a puppy, adult, senior, geriatric, hospice care can be appropriate if we are um, preparing to say goodbye. So we, when I see a pet for a hospice, and this is Marmaduke, a Great Dane, I'm gonna do a lot of observation. I can, I can almost see when a pet is in pain and it's very difficult for pet owners to see pain as much as we can from coming from the outside. Uh, at Lap of Love, we go to the homes to do evaluation, which is really great because then we can see if they're anxious in their own home environment. Taking your pet to the veterinarian sometimes is totally fine, but sometimes it can add a little anxiety onto the, onto the menu. So at home, we could really evaluate a little bit better. Their facial expression tells us so much where they're located, where you are located, because I know a lot of uh, family members will start to sleep in a living room or in a spare bedroom with their pet. And I wanna make sure everybody's as comfortable as possible. I look around the house, I look for scary spots. So stairs or getting trapped in some place or a pool because they may fall in the pool uh, when, when somebody's not home, things like that. And also other pets. So did you, Marmaduke actually had two other uh, Great Danes that lived in his house and one was like eight months old. So anytime Marmaduke would try to go out to the side, outside, the eight month old knocked him over. And also I'm looking at Marmaduke's flooring because he had mobility issues. The most common problem that we see is mobility issues. And he's on a tile floor. And I want that whole floor covered in bath mats and yoga mats and things like that. So we're going to look at the house and how can we set it up. So now let's talk about my five elements of hospice care. So as a veterinarian, I'm going to cover each one of these with my family members. First is medication or treatment options. Next is the environment, caregiver support, quality of life assessments, and euthanasia or natural, natural passing. So I'm just going to touch on each one of these. First up, medication and treatment. So this is going to be to make sure that our pets are, are, uh, have the medication needed, whether it's supplements, whether it's pain management, anxiety management, uh, anti-nausea medication, um, appetite stimulants, whatever it is to make them feel better. And we are going to be managing a lot of mobility cases, maybe hydration. So we want to give some fluids under the skin. A lot of uh, dogs that have kidney failure, they may need some subcutaneous fluid therapy. Like I said, appetite, are they eating better? 
uh, with a certain type of food? Do they need an appetite stimulant? Are they uh, having incontinence or are they getting dirty? Are they having diarrhea? So it's getting clumped on their fur, their happiness, uh, which to me is the opposite of, of suffering. And, and most important also is, is pain, which we're gonna get to in a second. So we as veterinarians have a ton in our toolbox to help with, um, with these things. And it's not just medications. It might be massage, like I was talking about with bogey. It may be laser therapy. It could be acupuncture. It could be the exercise program that we're gonna uh, start, to, start to, to put in place. So we just wanna make sure that we address these, these major six, six symptoms that we often see. And chronic pain is very difficult for people to evaluate, especially with their own pet. And, you know, we know when, when some, when a dog's got an acute pain. So for instance, you got hit by a car or you tore your ACL, they're going to limp. You're going to see it. But I got to tell you, sometimes dogs will, will tear their ACL and they're limping and they're not putting weight at all on their leg, yet they're still kissing you and feeding and all that stuff. So we could see it usually, but with chronic pain, sometimes it's not very noticeable because dogs don't complain like we do. There's no benefit to their complaining uh, because with an acute pain, they're, they're, they're sometimes going to yelp. And sometimes dogs will also with chronic pain, but we got to make sure that we address this. And sadly, 48% of dogs in the United States that get euthanized have not seen their veterinarian for the year before they're euthanized, which means they are in pain. They have anxiety. They're not feeling good. They're dealing with the symptoms of their disease or old age, and they're not getting help. That is like you and I not going to our doctor for the last 20 years of our life. It's massive. And man, we could do so much for these guys. So there are three types of pain that I'm going to address. The first type of pain is the sensory pain that we will all understand, which is like arthritis or a hip dysplasia or a, a, a disc issue or a ACL. So the, that type of pain, everybody understands, but there are other types of pain. Disease or malaise. Disease means dis-ease and malaise is just feeling crappy. So the dog with kidney failure, end-stage kidney failure, end-stage lymphoma, they just don't feel good. They, you know, they're nauseous, which is horrible. Um, and then the other type of pain is anxiety and distress. Uh, some of these dogs, when they've got cognitive dysfunction, will have separation anxiety. They're going to not get, uh, not sleep through the night and they're going to be panting and pacing. You can just see it in their face. And dare I say, anxiety is even worse than arthritis. If any of you suffer from anxiety yourself, you will, you will understand and, and appreciate that. Um, okay. So then there's something called uh, allodynia. Allodynia is uh, when you are sensitive to a type of pain that normally or sensitive to a sensation that normally should be um, should not hurt at all. So, for instance, um, uh, somebody petting you or well, your pet, somebody petting your pet should feel good. And when you are in so much pain already from arthritis or something else, that petting, that brushing, that um, even that the air from the air conditioner blowing on them can actually be painful. Many times when I'm going to give a little injection, which is a tiny little needle and a bit of solution, and they're like, ah, because they're already in pain. I have migraines. And when I have a migraine and somebody comes near me or touches me or hugs me, it's, it's worse. So this is a very big issue that people forget about. And, and sometimes, sometimes families will get mad at me because I, because they think I've hurt their dog, but really it tells me that their dog is already in a lot of pain and it's not being addressed. Inappetence is not a good feeling. We have some great things that we can try to give to our, our, our pets towards the end. However, I never want to force feed a pet. They become anticipatory, which means they know you're coming at them and nobody wants to be force fed and it's heartbreaking for everybody. And eventually your pet will have caregiver aversion and run from you. And that's not good. And uh, inappetence is, is a very important decision factor when making euthanasia um, decisions. However, know that your pet, depending on the disease they have, may not lose their appetite. So I love to, to, to refer back to a quote that I heard from human hospice, that food and water are for the living and the body won't eat or drink for a future it knows that it does not have. And there are times where our pets will stop eating, not every disease, so please know that, but um, 
I know that some people think that if he's not eating, he will die. But they're actually not eating because they're dying. And we need to make sure that they're still comfortable and not force feed them. Now, the other element of hospice is environmental management. And it is so important that we keep them comfortable and safe. I don't want them falling down a couple of steps. I don't want them getting stuck under the pool table. I don't want them falling into the pool. Uh, so we want to make sure that they're that they are comfortable and safe. And that also, if you have a toddler and you've got a golden retriever or whatever, that is the nicest, sweetest dog in the universe that would never hurt a fly, but he's got severe arthritis, that toddler may touch him and snap. And so we have to be careful that everybody's safe. Uh, cognitive dysfunction is something we see so much of. And so in our environmental examination, I want to make sure that they're not only protected, but they have a lot of mental stimulation. With our mobility dogs, I want to make sure that they have exercise stimulation. So there's so much that we can do. Next up is caregiver support. So how do we help you guys that are, that are caring for these pets? And I know how hard it is because I've had my own. And there's something called caregiver burden. And that is strain felt by someone taking care of a loved one with an illness. And your loved one is your pet. You're also dealing with all your own problems and this can become extremely overwhelming. And after the pet's quality of life, caregiver burden is the next reason people will say goodbye to their pet. And we go through a lot and we will do a lot, but when it's caring too much, well, this is a personal decision and it's not one I'm here to, to judge anybody for. I know some people that would say putting a dog in a wagon is too much. It's a dog and that's not right. Well, you know what, this little guy, he still liked to go to the park or go for a walk with his buddies, but it was too much for him. So they would, they would uh, bring him to the park in his wagon and let him go run around the park and put him back in the wagon before he goes home. That's fine. What about a feeding tube? So this is a cat with, uh, with cancer and she was not eating and they had a feeding tube in for a, for a couple of months. And so the cat was able to get its nutrition. Now I did not place this feeding tube, but I wanted to make sure that it was kept clean that we didn't have any infection going on. And some people may say that's too much. Is this too much? So, so wee wee pads all over the house? For some people, no. And for some people, yes. And it might be different in the house too, because there's, there's multiple people in the house and what they will tolerate. There's a wonderful website called petcaregiverburden.com. And it has a lot of good information, some blogs. Uh, and it's uh, really good for information about caring for your sick pet. And so it's one, it's, uh, run by a wonderful Dr. Mary Beth Spitznagel, and it talks a lot about what you guys can go through. There's also something called anticipatory grief, which is grief before the death happens. And when you know you're, you've got a limited amount of time, anticipatory grief is very heavy. So that has to be addressed during hospice. And I always talk to my caregivers and say three things. First, at any time, it's, a, it's okay to say goodbye. You're in my hospice program. If you had two days, and you called me Monday and the last two days were horrible and you can't imagine going through that again and your pet going through that again, I support your decision to say goodbye. If you called me on Monday and said, oh my gosh, we had the best weekend ever, I support your decision to say goodbye. If you say that's how I want it to be, I want him to, to go on a good note. So uh, I give you permission to stop at any time. I give you permission to be stressed, be tired, even be angry. <laughs> it's not easy. And I'm always going to have a conversation about quality of life assessments. And that is my next element of hospice is quality of life. And I believe I've done a, a, a lecture for the Gray Muzzle Organization on this alone. But know that it is not just, you know, one way or the other. You will not always know. Some people will say that, don't worry, you'll know. They'll give you a look. The light will go out of their eyes. If you are waiting for a look, you are waiting for the pain and disease to be so severe that it's outwardly obvious and they're so bad. So if you're waiting for that, we actually may be waiting for them to start suffering very badly. So I believe that we don't want to wait for a look. However, when I'm helping families assess quality of life, I have to think about what ailment they have and how they will pass from it. So many people want their pet to die in their sleep at two o'clock in the night, which is, is not a bad uh, thing that you'd want. but that is not going to happen if we've got heart failure. They may die at two o'clock in the night, but they're going to wake up and drown in their lung fluid. So the, the ailment or the disease they have is going to change their quality of life, and dare I say, their quality of death. Uh, so a mobility dog, one that's got really bad arthritis, they will not die on their own. 
we have to make that decision. So I'm, I'm going to have a big conversation about that. The pet's personality, how well are they managing the problems that they have? Are they scared to take the medication? Are they running from the family? Are they um, scared and have anxiety? Or are they just taking it all in stride? Just like us, they're all different. Next up is the personal beliefs. Every single person on this phone or on this webinar is different. Everybody has different beliefs. One may want to do chemo, one may not. One may want to do natural passing, one may want euthanasia. So we're all so different and I'm going to talk to the family about what their beliefs are. And then there are four budgets of life. There's the monetary budget. Can they afford to do the treatment? Can they afford the medication? Uh, can they afford the yoga mats all over their house? There's the physical budget. Can they actually lift this dog up? Can they give the sub-Q fluids? Uh, can they clean up after them because they physically have their own issues? Are they, do they have enough time? Is the time budget? Do they have enough time to care for their pet that's at the very end? It's, it's, it's very time consuming. And if you have a job that's eight hours a day plus commute and uh, you're gone for 10 hours and your pet is not doing well when you're not home, that may become a consideration of quality of life. And then there's the emotional budget. So what does this pet, like, is this pet the last living link to someone else that you've lost and you want to hold on to the very last minute? Or have you gone through something before and you don't want it to happen again? Do you are, you know, do you have so much stress going on in your own life that you can't care for this pet as well as you wish you could towards the end? So at any time, if any one of those budgets is up, I support the family to say goodbye. So a quality of life discussion is going to be very big. And I, I take about 40 minutes with just my quality of life discussion. So that was just a little tidbit of that. And next I will discuss in my last element of hospice care, euthanasia and natural death. And so a lot of people are scared of euthanasia. Maybe they've had a bad experience last time. Maybe they felt they waited too long. Maybe they felt they waited, they did it too soon. So I'm going to discuss the way that I euthanize pets and how we do sedation, how the medication works how and when appointments can be booked because sometimes your veterinarian may not be available for you on Sunday and you have to go to the emergency clinic and you need to, you need to know that. Let's talk about who wants to be present, other pets or other family members. And then what are the aftercare options? So do you wanna bury your pet? But we're in Buffalo and it's January, you can't bury your pet, what should we do? Um, maybe you would like, um, um, the pet to be cremated, but you want the ashes to be spread out by the, by the crematory. You don't want them back in an urn. So we're gonna have this discussion and prepare everybody. And then there's passing without assistance or some people who say this is um, natural passing. So I am always gonna, when somebody does not want their pet to be euthanized, I'm going to talk about the disease they have and the way they will die from it. Also, if you don't wanna be present, uh, I'm sorry, if you don't want, to euthanize your pet, know that you may not be present for the passing. It could happen in the middle of the day when you're at work and coming home to a pet that has passed might be shocking to you. It's not always at two o'clock in the morning in bed. So, and then if it is even two o'clock in the morning in bed, you're still not there. For me personally, I always want to be present. I, I always want them to know that I'm by, by their side and how much I love them. Knowing also that you may see some reactions uh, as they as they pass. So if you are actively watching your pet pass, um, it can be a little bit traumatic. So there's there could be absolutely no reaction at all. There also could be twitching, muscle stretching, seizures, gasping, things like that. And it is very difficult to watch. And then a lot of times people rush them to the emergency room during this time. And like I mentioned earlier, it's not always at night. It could be happening at any time. So to recap, I've got my five elements of hospice, the medication, the palliative care, palliation is very important, making sure they're pain-free and as, and as anxiety-free as possible, how to arrange their environment, what kind of support we're going to give you. At Lap of Love, we have a pet loss support line that's got free pet loss support groups all during the week, and one that includes anticipatory grief. We're going to go over our quality life assessments. We're going to set up the the the, the um what our goals of care are as well. And then we're gonna talk about what you would like for the passing of your pet and making sure that we, can, that we can have that happen. This wonderful quote I love, you matter because you are you and you matter to the end of your life. We will do all we can, not only to help you die peacefully, but also live until you die. And that is exactly what I think hospice is. So what about my friend Bogey? Did he make it to the holidays with his lymphoma? 
Well, absolutely, Bogey made it to the holidays. I couldn't say such a sad story for this conversation. And he did. So he was their Christmas Christmas card cover boy one more time. And so that was December 25th. But just a week later, it was time to say goodbye to Bogey. So laying on his couch with his parakeet friend there and, uh, and, a, and a bowl of popcorn, we said goodbye to Bogey. And then um, on his favorite place on his couch, surrounded by everybody that he loves. And so then the next day, the family went to the beach and sent me this message because Bogey loved the beach. Thank you so much for your kind help with Bogey. You have a special gift and you share it wonderfully. As difficult as yesterday was, we can't imagine the process going any better. And that's what hospice can be. We can make it so good towards the end. And so uh, with that, I'm going to answer some questions. And as Lisa mentioned, I did publish a book a couple of months ago. It's called It's Lever Never Long Enough. I cover everything from aging to ailments and also hospice and quality of life discussions that I just talked about. So it's all available online on Amazon, books a million, things like that. So uh, that's it. So I know I've got a couple of questions bleeping at me, but maybe the gray muzzle peeps can come back on and I could do some questions that may be in the uh, Facebook group as well. So uh, somebody in my questions here that she couldn't hear, was it tramadol or trazodone? So in Bogey's case, Bogey was put on tramadol for pain. However, in dogs, dogs do not have a, met uh, a metabolite that actually gives them the pain relief that we get from tramadol. So it makes them sleepy, but it does not give them pain relief. So I don't put dogs on tramadol for pain relief. So hopefully that answers that question. And then, um, uh, so, jo so Joanne, I had heard that massage can't be do done with dogs who have cancer. My dog has hemangiosarcoma. So massage can be done. We don't want to do laser. So uh, any, any dog with cancer, we don't want to stimulate the blood flow. Uh, so you could certainly, if your dog has, especially if your dog has edema, we might want to do some massaging, what we call effluage. So um, we just, and that's just to help get the, get the fluid out of their, out of their limbs. A massage can be done on their shoulders and things like that. We wouldn't want to massage their belly because that's where hemangiosarcoma is usually a, a splenic rupture. So, uh, so they could have uh, mast cell cancer. We certainly wouldn't want to be massaging right around that cancer spot. But a lot of times it, it's, it's, it's uh, very comforting to, to a pet. Uh, let's see. Somebody asked about cognitive canine dysfunction. So this is um, just to, to simplify it, if you will, this is a condition that is just like Alzheimer's in, in, in humans. So sometimes people call it doggy dementia, a doggy Alzheimer's, and it can start as early as seven years old for dogs. And some of the symptoms that you will see is a little bit of anxiety, confusion. They might stand in place. I remember this one patient, his name was little guy, and he just stood in place and stared at the ground like a zombie for five hours at a time until he passed out. Like he was just so tired. So um, it could be that they don't recognize certain people. Panting and pacing, I see a lot. So they're just on it now. Panting and pacing could be also pain. So we wanna make sure we address that. So there's not a test for cognitive dysfunction. It's ruling out other things. Um, in, in cats, I know we're a dog group here, but cats, they'll do this weird meow like wow. <laughs> and, uh, so we want to make sure that they, you know, they're not just being sassy. They've actually had some things going wrong and mental stimulation is very important. So the, there's like a lot of cognitive gains that you can do with your pet. A lot have to be food motivated, but we can also, the sooner we start giving them nutraceuticals and other, you know, food that has certain additives to it can be very helpful. And there are times we do have to start giving certain medications to help them with cognitive dysfunction. There is no cure just like in human, but it is a large percentage of our older dogs do get some kind of cognitive dysfunction, which I share a lot in that book. Let's see, is there any other question? Yes, there's a question in the chat. Do you have any tips for vet nurses involved in the hospice care process or who may be the in-between for ensuring communication about hospice care, oh, that for ensuring communication about hospice care occurs? Okay, so um, hello, veterinary technician. And I have to tell you that when I lecture to 
um, at veterinary conferences, the people who line up after my talk the most to ask me questions and get information on this are technicians. They're wonderful angels that could do so much in the hospice world. So you could do the quality of life discussions with families. You could, if you can um, go to somebody's home, there's a lot of times patients or families need respite care. Even for my own dog, I had a very large Doberman that he needed care every four hours. So I, I always had to be home and I had friends that came in from out of town and I wanted to take them to Disney World, but I couldn't leave for 10 hours. So I had a technician come in and stay with him for the day. And it just let, gave me kind of peace to you know, have, have a day off. Everybody, we all need time off, even I do. So there's so much that veterinary technicians can do. They could do so much with the environmental changes in the house. A technician, just so for everybody on the call, cannot prescribe or diagnose. So they cannot prescribe medications. They cannot diagnose a disease. They could administer medications that a veterinarian has uh, prescribed, but they can help so much with the environmental um, changes in the house. So if you ever think of a human that's going into hospice, if they're staying at their, at their own home, a nurse will come in and set up the house to be safe. They're going to put, you know, the, um, Clean up. They're actually going to usually take away the rugs so somebody doesn't trip and fall. Where us in our hospice, we usually put down rugs. And there is a wonderful organization. It's going to, I'm going to say it slow because it's hard, but it's the International Association for Animal Hospice and Palliative Care. The initials are IAAHPC. It has a ton of information for everybody on this call, but there's also a members group. So I'm a member of that for over a decade. And there's a technician track that you can also get hospice certified. So hopefully that answered the question, Lisa. Great. There's another question about liquid gabapentin and whether it's good for pain and anxiety, how often and how much. So uh, gabapentin in general is very good for pain. Usually, usually when we reduce pain, we reduce anxiety. Uh, and gabapentin can also make them a little bit sleepy, which helps not much, but a little bit sleepy with it. So, um, uh, so gabapentin, I usually start with a lower dose and, um, and I usually start first at night. So that way, if it does make them sleepy, we sleep through the night. So I usually start with the a night dose and then add every, um, every 12 hours. And then you can go very high on, on the dose and the, and I'm not going to talk about dosing here because I don't want to, um, I want to make sure that you speak to your veterinarian about it because there could be other things going on that I don't want to overdose or underdose or anything like that. But oftentimes we might give it every six hours. It is easier to keep pain away than chase it away. So if you know your, I have, I know so many people that are like, oh, I just give this on a bad day, which I get. But when we're at the end, like there every day is a bad day. They're just not telling us. So they're not showing outwardly signs. So I would keep them on it. Now, the question is about liquid gabapentin. Uh, I've, I've had uh, much success with that. Compounding pharmacies are great. They can put it in different flavors for you and things like that. So uh, I'm, I'm a fan of, of liquid gabapentin and it's sometimes easier to, to administer. How about hyperbaric oxygen chambers? Are they good for arthritis? So there's been a lot of research that does say it, not just for our dogs, but also for us, because it increases oxygenation around the system and decreases inflammation. So um, I would do it. It's, it's not easy to find a place in South Florida. I know we have one at the University of Florida. We have a hyperbaric chamber, but um, so, so they're not easy to come by and it is an expense. However, I do know that it uh, has, has a lot of research behind it that shows good things with, with with arthritis. Is best practice for the actual euthanasia procedure to give the pet medication to sleep before the lethal med medication? I've noticed some vets do and others don't. So fantastic question. I actually dedicate a lot to this in, in my book. Medically and technically, it is not required if the final medication is given in a vein. So, uh, so just like a catheter placement or in a vein, in a leg vein or something like that, because the final medication is an overdose of anesthesia. So we, it, the medication is like a pentobarbital and we give a, a, a four time dose that we normally, I mean, it's just an extremely high dose. And what that does is it puts the brain to sleep and the brain is what's in charge of all the organs and functions. So they'll all stop as well. 
So uh, it does not hurt. Uh, it's very peaceful and they, and, they, and they sleep. So it is not a requirement to do medically. Um, it is, I feel so much better to give sedation beforehand. And every one of the Lapala veterinarians, we will always give sedation beforehand for a number of reasons. One is I would like that pet to feel better before they pass. So our medication cocktail has some pain management in it. So we'll give it under the skin or in their muscle. And again, they may yelp at this. Remember in the beginning when I said that allodynia, where they, they're not it, like just things that shouldn't hurt, hurt. And I'll give that sedation and the dog will be like, ah, but that means they're in a lot of pain. And I'm glad I'm giving it because I want them to have a moment of no pain. When I give that medication the way that we do, so under the skin or on, in the muscle, it takes about five or 10 minutes. So after we give that medication, they're still alert. They're still chomping on a cupcake or whatever they would like to eat if they're eating. And then about three or four minutes in, they start to get sleepy and will usually snooze. It's, uh, it's not gonna be, normally they're, they're completely asleep. Sometimes they may wake up to stimulation or if I touch a, a toe and they're highly sensitive to their toes being touched, they may wake up for that. A lot of times owners will talk very loudly to their pets at the end. So the pet will be sleeping and it's perfect. And then the owners will say, you know, hi, bye, Rusty, and, and talk really loud to them, or we're here, and it might wake them up. But uh, so sedation is nice for the, uh, for the pet to have that, that phase of feeling good and comfortable. Owners really like to see that. Um, and then uh, also for me, I, I don't like to see a pet completely alive. And then when I give that, step, that final medication, go from alive to passing so quickly. I believe that 10, 15 minute transition period is uh, helpful for me to see a pet transition from awake to sleeping to have become an angel. And I think it's also helpful for family members. So it is, uh, AVMA does not, the American Veterinary Medical Association does not require it. Uh, there are one state I know of Virginia that actually requires it, but it is not a technical requirement, but it is, I believe, a, be a, a better way to do it, but it is not, uh, it is not have to. I hope I answered that okay. I got a little long-winded because um, it's a soapbox of mine. <laughs> no, that was really helpful. Thank you. Um, we have a question about medications for cognitive dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Oh, like what medications? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot out there. There's selegiline. There's sometimes amitriptyline. You're, there, there are medications available. Um, and it is just best that we start them sooner than later. Some medications can't be given with others. So that's why you definitely need to have your veterinarian um, help out. There's some wonderful diets available. Purina Bright Minds has been amazing. Um, Hills has BD, I think is their brain diet, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. So we could start them uh, on that. I, I don't know if Purina Bright Minds is prescription diet. I know Hills is. And then, um, and then there's other, some other nutraceuticals that I'll, that I'll put pets on. Sometimes towards the end, you know, with hospice, we see them so late. Again, 50% of dogs and cats are not brought to their veterinarian a year before they die. We could do so much. And that's when I want to see them. When I see them from hospice, we usually... Um, it's only about two weeks my, on average. I, I have a pet for hospice. I would like them for five months in hospice because we could do so much, but people wait. And I understand why, but, but they wait. And when I have a dog in hospice that has cognitive dysfunction, it's very much just getting them to sleep through the night. And it might be something like trazodone to get them to sleep through the night. But when they start showing those mild signs, get them to your veterinarian and get them on some good stuff. Um, have you ever worked with a veterinary social worker or referred any of your pet parents or families to a veterinary social worker? Um, so yes, I have. And, uh, there, those are far and few between it's, uh, like I said, in the beginning, it's a, it's a team oriented approach. And so what a family needs can be very different. So, uh, yes, we have, we also, uh, you know, have worked with, with actual mental health counselors, because some people going through grief need a counselor. Uh, we have our pet loss support group ourselves, like I mentioned, 
that we opened over a year ago free to anyone. They don't have to go through Lap of Love. They could, I mean, it's through Lap of Love, but they don't have to use Lap of Love. Um, some people don't need any support. They, they're, they're okay. They just need help with the environment. So I want to make sure I tailor my hospice um, conversation and care for what a family needs. Um, how do you feel about a dog being present at a companion dog's euthanasia? Okay. Oh, what a great, what a great question. So um, I, first, I want to make sure that the pet and the family, the pet that's being euthanized in the family um, are not distracted by a very rambunctious, crazy dog. Because sometimes that is the case where we have a young puppy or, and they're just all over me, all over the, and they're not, they're not knowing what's going on. And that I might say is a little distracting, similar to a child about four years or younger, they could just be distracting and they're not necessarily getting what we're doing. But I actually really think it's a good idea to have pets around. I don't put them away. They could do whatever they want. If they want to come close, they can. I don't force a pet. So I've had some families that will drag the other pet and like, hey, like sniff him. And, th and then they're all nervous about it. I think, uh, I think it's good. So that way, if a family, if a pet wants to sniff their friend afterwards, they can. And uh, we do know that a large a portion of pets will go through a little bit of depression, if you will. Uh, when they lose their 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 mate, so there's been no evidence that shows being present is better. But uh, just because we don't have the evidence doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. So I think it's okay as long as it's not going to distract the, uh, the the family. I actually talk about that in my book too. Other other pets present. Right. Good question. Um, there's a question about multivitamins and being able to give multivitamins when a pet is on other medications. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, so polypharmacy, that's what we call that, right? So when you've got a lot of stuff, that you should really speak to your veterinarian about to, and understand what the combination is. You'd be surprised. And that's why you have to share with your veterinarian what over-the-counter drugs you're giving. So many times people forget about, oh, I'm also giving them melatonin. And, uh, and that could could you know, maybe have a side effect with something else. So share with your veterinarian everything that you're giving and you'd be surprised what things could not be in combination with each other. And then if you don't tell them, we don't know. I'm actually on a medication myself right now, uh, a blood thinner, and I'm not allowed to have grapefruit juice. So who would have known? So make sure you share what, what you're giving your pet over the counter with your vet. Okay. Um. Any thoughts on anti-gravity socks? Anti-gravity socks? Yeah, I, I, I can't say that I've ever heard of them before. I wasn't sure if you had. I have not. And I wonder if she's thinking about the toe ups or, or like the, the, the socks to make your toe flip better. So if she could respond to that, 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 that or he, that would be great. I've never heard of anti-gravity socks. Yeah, it, I think it's um, about arthritis. So it says... Um, Corgi mix, stray, no prior history, 17 pounds, approximately 14 years old, arthritis spurs along spine, body curved towards hind end, rear left foot turned in, walks fairly well on grass and carpet, slips sometimes on wood floors and tiles, sometimes can't get back and up on meds with that. Yeah, so uh, turned in or turned over is my question. I know she says turned in. Uh, I've never heard of an anti-gravity sock. Does that mean it's not out there? I don't know everything, but I don't know about that. I would say uh, harnesses are so good. Um, my number one favorite harness, uh, and I don't get a dime for saying this, is the help them up harness. Uh, I just love that harness. You go check them out, help them up harness. And then if your dog does have a toe flip, you can get some... There are some booties that have to be, it's best to get your veterinarian to help put it on, uh, but it actually helps keep the toe up because when they start to drag their toe and drag their feet, they can get um, you know, abrasions and they can stumble and things like that. So, uh, so I think with, with any dog with arthritis, it's to first manage the pain and then keep them moving, get them using their muscles. Lymph, the lymphatic systems move because we use our muscles. 
the anti-inflammatories move because we use our muscles. So definitely keep them moving as long as we manage their pain first. So here's a really interesting question. What have you found to be the most challenging aspects of hospice care personally and professionally, and what have been the most rewarding? Wow, these are really good questions. <laughs> yeah, that's a great one. Oh my gosh. Okay, so I mean, something, I think Lisa, we should just do Q&A day. Um, <laughs> who needs me chatting beforehand? Okay, wow. Uh, wait, the, the, the most challenging, the most challenging for me is getting, getting there so late, meaning the families wait and they don't know there's hospice and, and they don't know there that we could do so much as, as a veterinary profession. Some people think we just want money and that we're like, we're just going to throw medications at them. We're, we do a lot <laughs> and, uh, and it does not require diagnostics and blood work and things like that. We're going to care for, we're going to care for symptoms. So sadly, I, we see them at lap of love too late. I want to help them sooner. So that's the most struggle for me. That's why I'm doing this for you guys to like know about it. And, and when you've got these problems, go see your veterinarian. Um, so, so that has been a big struggle. It, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart so bad to know that 48% of dogs and uh, over 50% of cats have not being seen and not getting help. That's so, that's just so, so sad. Um, it's one of the reasons why I wrote that book. Uh, and my cat book is coming out in the summer. But um, the most rewarding thing, oh gosh, uh, we don't have enough time. It is, it is families like, like Bogey's family. It is the ones that I can help. And look at Bogey. I saw him on December 10th and we let him go 21 days later. That was three weeks. And I, it is years. And I remember them. We still talk, we still email each other. Like there it, it's, that is so rewarding to help a family in their most darkest days with a little bit of grace and dignity and to give them a little more time. Let's talk about bucket lists and make a bucket list. And then they send me pictures of the bucket list. Like, I'm sorry, I have, there is no better job than being a, a hospice veterinarian. Great answer, great answer. Um, I don't, um, Amanda, do you see any other questions that we've oh, missed? I see one from Jack. I've got a, this is a great one in this whole thing. How uh, long after they pass much the body be prepared for what is next? I.e., can they stay home overnight? And man, Jack, you gotta get my book because I talk about this too. So, um, because this is a great question, we're so fast to take the body of our pets away. I think we are a very death adverse society and it, it can be a little bit unnerving to some people to see their pet there. No judgment, by the way, either way. However, I have helped a lot of families that actually want um, a few hours or even a few days with their pet after they have passed. So um, if you're, all I would say is you keep them in a temperature controlled area, like in 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, you know, I'm from South Florida, so we don't want them outside or super hot or anything like that. Um, and what I did even for my own girl, I, I euthanized her at night and I waited to the next day to take her to, to the crematory. I actually own the crematory. It's in South Florida. So, um, so I just put the blanket over her. I, I put a little, um, I put like a little plastic bag under her rear end and put a towel on top of that because I knew she would lose her bowels and, 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 uh, and that was okay. So I, I put that there to keep her clean and I just put a blanket over her. I kept her head out and, um, and then placed her on my stretcher and brought her to the crematory myself the next day. So just so everybody knows if after passing, a few hours after passing, they will go into rigor mortis. And then by the next, then by the next day, they may release that rigor mortis. So some people don't like, they don't understand that, that, that process happens. And uh, so just to be prepared for it. And then the, the, the thing I always prepare owners for is that their eyelids will not close. The eyelids are a muscle and it takes, it takes electricity to close the eyes. So when your pet has passed, their eyes will be just in a relaxed state. It drives me bonkers when I see on TV that somebody goes like this and the eyes close because that's not true. Um, and so uh, in funeral homes, they'll actually um, 
have eye tissue glue to, to close the eyes. And so I'll do that as well. If a family wants the viewing at our crematory, we'll close them with tissue glue. So I, I know some people are like, what? That's crazy talk. But I think it's important to, to bring it up because some families want time with their pet and that is okay. I did it. I, I had about 16 hours with my girl and that was fine. Um, how do you feel about rescuers or pet sitters being present for euthanasia? Oh, rescuers or pet sitters. Huh. You know, I think euthanasia is a very um, personal decision and who, who is present is really up to the, the owner. So my dog, Duncan, he was just a little lady flirt and he had many human girlfriends. And so I had a party for him days before and this was on his bucket list. I actually have his bucket list and it says visits from all his girlfriends. And so I had his pet sitter. I had his nurse that came. They all came and said goodbye and brought him, you know, cookies and, and French fries and things like that. But for his goodbye, that was my personal moment to say goodbye to him. And I didn't want anybody there. And I, I let him go myself. I did the euthanasia. Uh, I barely wanted dad there. I just wanted to cry the house down and sob like crazy and be present with him and not talk to anybody else. But that's me. I have also been to families where we've had a party. I remember Jupiter. There was a dog named Jupiter and I pull up and there's about 30 people and they all had a uh, Hawaiian lays on and they had margaritas. Like it was a party for Jupiter and it was amazing. So I think it's a personal decision. And, um, I, I also, I also care about people who might be judgy because some people, what our budgets are could be very different for someone else. What I can handle physically, emotionally, mentally, financially might be different than someone else. And what I don't want is someone there judging the decision of an owner. That is their decision to make. And, um, and, that's, and, that, is, and that is okay. So uh, I, I don't want somebody there to, to, make it, to, to make them feel bad. Thank you. There is just one, I know we're, we're getting up against the hour, but there was one um, comment about Tylenol. And I just wanna make sure we clarify that. Um, she said, I thought Tylenol was a no-no. Yep, I'm, I'm glad we talked about that. So Tylenol is absolutely positively lethal to cats. Tylenol is, uh, a, so do not ever give it to your cat. Tylenol is actually something that we can use for pain relief in dogs. And, uh, and I've used it often. And I also have it compounded with some codeine. So that's a three-year veterinarian. I'm not going to talk about the dosing because I think it's important to talk to your veterinarian because if your dog does have some liver disease, just like any medication, do not give dog, your second dog, your first dog's drugs. Like it is very important to talk to your veterinarian. So it is, uh, it is not actually lethal to a, a, a dog. It is to a cat. Thanks for clarifying that. All right. Well, I really have enjoyed um, listening to you today. And I just appreciate so much that you've shared your knowledge and just talk so openly and honestly about a topic that, you know, I think it's sometimes hard to talk about. So I just think it is. It is. It is. And, and I know. And if anybody, you know, I'm on Instagram and Facebook, Dr. Mary Gardner, and, and you could always message me if you've got, you know, something. And you know, we do tell advice all the time because people need, need to talk to somebody that's not going to judge them. And, you know, there are, there are what, what, what we want to do with our pets is it is a personal decision. The, I think we all share one thing in common and that is we don't want them to suffer. That's important. So please know we're here to support your decisions, but we want to make sure they're not suffering. And that goes along. If you want natural passing, I will support that. But we're going to make sure that they've got good pain management on board. And I lost my uncle last April and he was on morphine. He was on a lot of drugs. And so I don't want a pet to feel the ravages of their disease towards the end. And that's what I think that we would all agree on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you again. We truly appreciate you and your great work on behalf of senior animals and, and also their people. So thank you. Thanks to everybody who joined us today.